Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our second KNU online conference titled Maximizing the New Normal. With the fall semester now underway, it is clear we need to move forward. We need to accept our new reality. And indeed, we need to find ways to take advantage and maximize the new opportunities ahead of us. So I am delighted to introduce our KNU president, Dr. Sung Dong Kim, to share his welcome message and thoughts at this important time. Hello, colleagues, partners, and friends. It is my honor to welcome you to this conference and begin our next step in overcoming the challenges of the new normal. While we have learned and accomplished much so far, there is more we must do. We must continue to set the highest standards possible to build and maintain our administrative and educational goals. That starts here. Like all of you and your universities, KNU has committed itself to evolution, being open and ready for new ideas and approaches to problem solving that ensures we meet our expectations while keeping students and staff our top priority. Doing this requires dedication to teamwork and collaborations, exploring and testing new ideas that often demand greater flexibility. We have become a better team because of it. And I know that you, our partners, have done the same, helping to create a network of communication and cooperation that grows stronger every day. Much has changed, even in the months since our last conference. Therefore, it is important that we continue to meet and share practices that have worked and discuss situations that have not. It is our hope that today will provide that opportunity and so we may share, discuss, and learn from each other. I am confident that together this will prove very successful. What most impresses me is how even in the most challenging times, we have all come together in a unified standard. Our goals are your goals, and that shared effort is what makes conference like this so valuable. We all bring to this meeting a great deal of personal and professional experience. Now we are ready to maximize the new normal. Thank you. Thank you, President Kim, for your heartfelt message. So today's conference is live and an opportunity to share between partners. We are among friends, so don't hesitate to send us your comments and questions with or without your name and institution. Then we can make this a really interactive and learning opportunity. We've scheduled 10 minutes for Q&A after each presentation, so make sure to be an active audience. Now, our first speaker today is Samuel Ang from Quaquareli Simmons, known to most of us as QS, and which is responsible for the annual QS World University Rankings. And for those of you who haven't checked the rankings for 2021, are just out with no surprises among the top five. And one more interesting fact is that QS was actually started in 1990 as a student project. Anyways, QS is a lot more than just the world ranking list, but an important independent source of comparative data about university performance. As you can see here with subject and regional focuses. And I was particularly interested to discover that London, my hometown was the best student city in 2019. Hmm. Anyway, now Samuel is from the QS Intelligence Unit and the Regional Director for Asia, and he is particularly focused on analyzing survey data to make sense of what is happening in order to help universities strategize more effectively and, of course, 
to help students make informed choices for their futures. So to share his insights on the recent QS reports that are focusing on the impact of the coronavirus pandemic and which provide a very important comprehensive perspective, I'm really delighted to introduce Samuel Ong. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? yes we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Great, um, thank you very much for the introduction, Lauren, appreciate it. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, fellow um, academics and um, higher education institution staff, uh, it's uh, lovely to be here um, for this online uh, conference. And um, without further ado, uh, let me just share with you my screen to take you through the presentation that I have for you today. Okay, um, so essentially today's um, presentation is actually an abstract um, of a report that we have recently uh, produced um, in the month of September. Um, and this is basically getting insights from uh, current and prospective international students on how they are reacting to the current COVID-19 pandemic crisis. So before we go there, um, just let me share with you uh, very quickly, um, QS Crocker Rally Simmons, as you are aware, um, we are in the business of delivering the rankings results. So as you can see in this um, calendar over here, pretty much in every single month of the year, we have um, some um, rankings that are released. Um, particularly maybe for the Korean market, um, you will be interested in the World University Rankings by Subject, which is released in the month of March, the World University Ranking that is held in the month of June, and upcoming in November, we have the World University Rankings by the Asia region. So apart from the world rankings, um, we also do a lot of regional rankings. Um, and these are the various indicators that uh, QS look into when we rank the world university as well as all the rest of the regional rankings. Uh, for the purpose of today's uh, presentation, I will not be going through um, the rankings uh, methodology with you, but I'm happy to take on any questions that you may have after this presentation. Um, at QS, we provide consulting services to um, universities, uh, higher education institutions, um, think tanks, government um, that are interested to understand um, their market positioning, um, how they are faring in rankings, um, and um, you know where um, or how they are perceived internationally by their peers, by employers, by students. Um, and um, within the consulting team, we have a very um, uh, experienced um, team of uh, consultants um, who have been in the industry for over 20 years, um, delivering high quality market intelligence um, to institutions around the world. And um, this is some of the uh, four key areas that uh, our consulting team does, um, which is in the area of um, data solutions, um, providing insights in terms of your university's uh, ranking performance, uh, in terms of framework, uh, we look at the rankings performance model, various KPI institution uh, pedagogies. In terms of global engagement, um, we help university um, partner other like-minded universities who might be interested to do exchange program, to do research and other areas. And in terms of strategic auditing, we also help university in particularly in the area of marketing and communication. So this is um, the uh, overview of um, the, um, the slides that I will go through today. Um, for today's presentation, we will look at um, student responses from two perspectives. One, one, it is coming from current international students and secondly, um, through the eyes of prospective international students. So first up, in terms of the introduction, um, throughout the entire 2020, QS has actually been reporting on the findings on its uh, ongoing coronavirus student survey. 
We have been doing this since February, trying to understand what our student needs and how we can better inform universities about this. And since February, we have over 75,000 responses from prospective students around the world. From for, for September this uh, last month, we have actually opened to existing and newly enrolled students. And so this particular report that I'm delivering to you today is from the period of the 4th to the 21st of September. And from this particular survey, we had 312 current students and 2,689 2, prospective students. Um, every month, we will be releasing a report detailing the latest findings and also demonstrating how responses are changing over time. So for those of you who are looking at this uh, presentation, um, you can go on to our website, qs.com um, slash QS industry reports to download free copies of this information. So first of all, part one, um, based on the overview of responses of current international students. This survey is actually targeted at international students who are studying overseas. And uh, based on last month's numbers, we had 312 current international students from 86 countries. And of course, majority coming from India, 14%. And uh, of the students um, that are studying overseas, we have 13% studying in the UK, 11% studying in Australia, United States make up 6% and Canada making up the other 5%. So as you can see that uh, most of these international students are actually studying in, in a, a Western um, English language medium um, of education and out of which 55% are studying at an undergraduate level, 24% doing postgraduate by coursework and 11% by postgraduate by research. And of course, we have the remaining 5% doing um, vocational education and training and 3% doing English language courses and foundation. From this current study, we can also see that majority of the students are studying business management um, with a further 15% studying engineering and technology. So what does learning look like right now? The higher education landscape has changed dramatically. And as all of us are aware that a number of um, uh, countries around the world have not been able to uh, take in international students uh, as a result of the travel ban um, for many, many countries. So within this group itself, we have seen that 40% of respondents have enrolled in 2020. 32% enrolled in 2019 and 15% enrolled in 2018. And interestingly from this report, we have seen that a significant minority um, have actually a, uh, some elements of face-to-face -face teaching as part of their studies, 9% split between online and face-to-face -face, and 11% um, um, experiencing face-to-face -face with some online and 8% with um, all face-to-face. -face. So when we ask the question of um, um, you know, where they are studying um, their current course, 61% um, of those who responded mentioned that they are studying in the country where their university is based in, and 33% are studying remotely. So let me just um, uh, look at the final point. Of those who had actually um, studying remotely, 14% um, expect to travel to the country of their university by October, 11% by November, 17% by December, and 23% has chose January 2021. And uh, most of us are aware right now that it is probably very difficult for many international students um, to be starting school uh, in the country where the university is based in um, sometime this year. So we are most probably looking at 2021. So this is how um, the graph um, actually looks like uh, in terms of um, the questions that we have asked. So on the, the pie chart on the left, it showed it asked, in what year did you enroll? 
And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the 40% indicated that uh, we have enrolled this year. On the right-hand side of the pie chart, is your course currently being taught online or face-to-face? -face? Um, over 50% um, have indicated that it has been done 100% online. And um, so only 8% at the moment, as you can see in the light blue uh, column over here, um, it shows um, all face-to-face. -face. So everything else um, for a significant part of about 92%, um, there has certain degree of online learning um, for international students. So another question that's been asked is um, when does student expect to travel? Um, and uh, a significant majority um, is uh, looking at um, sometime next year. So this particular data um, shows that um, about two thirds uh, are looking to uh, travel uh, by next year. And uh, despite the surge in coronavirus, um, international students remain optimistic about their travel plans. Um, interestingly, uh, a minority 9% right at the end feels that they will not be able to travel to the country um, where the university is based at least until August 2021 or later. We have asked another question. Have you been asked to do any of the following since you have arrived in your destination country? So 45% were asked to quarantine, uh, quarantine themselves uh, or self-isolate and 44% were asked to actually avoid uh, contact with people outside of your own social bubble. Um, only about 15% were asked to take regular tests for COVID-19 and um, interestingly, 15% of the respondent indicated that they were not asked to do any of the above. So how are universities addressing this crisis? Um, and um, just a point to note that this is purely coming from an international student's perspective. Um, when we ask the question, which of the following is your university doing to limit the spread of coronavirus on campus? Um, majority of students have indicated that um, universities have made all classes online. Um, so isolating students do not miss anything and this make up um, 68%. And 57% um, uh, included uh, making mask covering essential in communal areas and 56% uh, indicated that hand gel is widely available on campus. I think this is um, really, really important. So how effective do you think university has been in supporting international students uh, during this crisis? Um, so currently, um, most of the international students are generally very positive about the experience that the university has given to them. And uh, promisingly, only 12% indicated that their university support have not been effective. And when we probe further, why they chose, uh, why they have indicated not at all effective, students referred to having a lack of communications from the university, um, lack of guidance and resources as some of the common reasons. So, Another question we ask is, did your current university offer you any following incentives to encourage you to study overseas? And uh, majority indicated 66%, none of the above. So although we understand that some universities have offered financial support, specifically tailored to student situation, some have provided nutritional support and flexible accommodation. Some institutions have also offered incentives to encourage their students to enroll or return to their studies overseas, including bursaries, scholarships, discounts, as well as um, uh, accommodation uh, discounts as well. So um, from this above um, chart, we can see that two thirds of the respondents did not actually receive anything um, from the university. So, as universities struggle at this point of time to attract international students, 
it may actually be worth exploring offering some of these incentives in greater detail in the coming months. Prospective international students may also be facing financial mobility restrictions as a result of this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in countries such as the UK, Australia, New Zealand, where students are allowed to work part-time, um, I have been made aware as well that a lot of part-time jobs have actually been, been uh, canned as a result of the uh, pandemic. So um, having such incentives um, to uh, international students will actually help lessen their financial burdens. So what do current students think the future holds for them? Um, so 19% of respondents indicated that um, they were very, very worried about contracting the coronavirus. 16% indicated that they were not uh, worried at all. And uh, current students were also asked to review uh, when they predicted life will actually uh, return to normal. Um, and uh, we can see here that, uh, you know, this remains largely divided. 14% uh, believe life will return to normal in three months. 18% believe uh, within six months. And uh, a further 29% probably uh, feel that this will happen in the next one to two years. Moving on to the second part of this presentation where we are looking at the responses from the prospective international point of view. This particular section, we have taken responses from over 2,600 students who are planning to study overseas. So where are these students coming from? 22% are from India. 6% from the US, 5% from Pakistan, 5% from Nigeria, 3% from the UK, 3% from Bangladesh, 2% from Canada, and others. A significant minority of these respondents are considering studying in the UK and the US, both each uh, contributing to 42%. 41% um, indicated uh, Canada, 27% Germany, Australia 24%, France 17%, and Netherlands 15%. Um, these prospective international students are planning to study at the undergraduate level, 41%, postgraduate coursework 37%, and postgraduate research 17%. Um, other areas like vocational training, foundation, and English language uh, make up um, the remainder um, 5%. So in terms of uh, the courses that students are planning to study, majority are looking at business and management at 22%, engineering technology at 21%. So when asked on when do they expect to start their studies, uh, many students indicated that they are hoping to start their studies in 2021, and this makes up about 74%. So 12% of our respondents, uh, which is about slightly over 200, indicated that they are planning to go in 2023 or even later. Has coronavirus affected their studies plan? We have seen in previous reporting that many students have chosen to defer or delay um, the start of their program to next year. In the chart below, we can see that 35% of international students had actually intended to begin their studies in 2020, which is this year. Additionally, a majority of respondents stated that coronavirus had affected their plans to study abroad, with 69% selecting this option. So of those who have been affected, 57% indicated now that they intend to defer or delay their studies till next year, and out of which 13% are now planning to study in a different country. For those respondents who were planning to study in 2020, a range of factors have affected their ability to start their studies, including government restriction, which makes up 32%, and also government restriction on arrival in a new country, which makes up another 
So this actually reiterates the importance of establishing travel corridors with other nations to allow international students to travel. Prospective international students are adapting their approach to account for the new restriction and adopting online learning. As part of this survey, we can also see that online learning appears to be gradually increasing. The proportion of respondents who are not interested in studying online has actually decreased from 42% when surveyed in March to 37% from last month's survey. So we can actually see that attitudes towards online learning uh, is uh, slightly changing slowly. So how can university best support international students? So these results differ from respondents from current students with prospective students, um, which 12% um, of prospective students view uh, that university has been um, extremely effective in supporting them compared to 20% uh, of internet of current students. Um, the biggest difference we have seen was in the area of the moderately effective option with 42% of prospective students choosing this compared to 29% of current students. Of the 7% of prospective students that selected not at all effective, many students have indicated that changing government guidance um, in action from university, high tuition fees and ongoing issues with office and accommodation tend to be the biggest factors uh, that they feel that the universities are not supporting them. So we found out that consistent communication and regular updates were frequently praised by the respondents, demonstrating the importance of your institution placement on communications to your prospective students. So when asked of what they need more information on as a result of this crisis, um, students responded by saying they needed more information on funding and scholarships. So institutions should keep these priorities in mind when crafting communications to prospective international students. Prioritizing information on funding scholarships as well as preparation for admissions exams. Prospective students were also asked to rank the financial incentive that would most likely to encourage them to study overseas. And of course, unsurprisingly, bursaries and scholarships were the most popular financial incentive with 54% selecting this as the top option. So apart from this, uh, we have other options such as discount on tuition fees, discount on accommodation, and money towards international flights as well. And these are what um, this, you know, the, the, the bar chart over here shows the responses from the prospective international students. So what do the prospective international students think about their future? When compared to current students, the results are similar. For prospective students, 15% view that life will go back to normal within three months, um, with up to 27% view that it will happen within the next six to 12 months. When prompted further, 42% um, felt that um, they will be comfortable to travel only when a vaccine is available and 42 other percent selected that they will want to travel when the university's campuses are open and face-to-face -face teaching has resumed. So this reiterates the importance of university establishing practices and procedures, which will allow for face-to-face -face teaching to occur whenever possible. And this will send a very strong and positive message to international students. So the next question we ask our students is, when do you think you'll be comfortable uh, to travel? Um, so uh, as part of this chart, you can see that 27% uh, indicated that they will travel once they are legally allowed to travel to the study destination country. And many respondents 
uh, indicated that uh, the choice of their study destination is now determined by how the government managed the coronavirus crisis. So um, when asked of um, which of the following uh, countries have handled the coronavirus outbreak well, um, New Zealand has come up on top with uh, 49%. And this has been consistent with the previous uh, reporting that we have done. And um, Germany comes very close at 27%, Canada 26 Australia 22 um, down on the list uh, is uh, United States uh, coming in at 7%. So um, in conclusion of this particular report, um, as 2020 academic year commences for many countries, um, institutions will need to uh, take care um, to consider how they can best protect not only their students, um, but also their staff while ensuring a high quality consistent educational experience. Um, and for those institutions who wish to hear more views of current and prospective students, um, QS will continue to report the ongoing coronavirus student survey on a monthly basis. Um, so please um, go to our website um, to find out more information. Um, with this, uh, let me just share with you my screen. Um, if you can see on this, uh, um, web page over here. All right, so all these reports are available for download for free. All right, so uh, apart from the, uh, you know, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic um, survey, um, we have other uh, reports uh, in terms of the international student survey. Um, this international student survey looked into um, what are the factors um, that influences uh, international student choice uh, when they are making the decision to study abroad. Uh, we have also the employer insights report and also other reports here as well. So all of these are available for download. Um, so feel free to come on to our website and, uh, and download this information. So with this, um, I'd like to uh, end my presentation for today. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to uh, take them. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. Excellent presentation and lots of work there, I know. A lot of information that you're handling. So we've got a few questions for you and we've also had some from the, the viewers today. So uh, first of all, I, I mean, you're talking about reports, but I want to ask, you have a more general view of the situation for universities. So do you see any exciting changes in higher education as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. So do you see any new opportunities? Um, well, um, one thing that is uh, for sure is that um, a lot of university has, um, you know, um, embraced technology and uh, have actually started to deliver uh, online programs for more courses um, across um, the university. Um, when I was um, traveling around the region in uh, January and February this year, when uh, it was still possible, um, many of the universities that I visited in Asia had indicated that uh, they were in the midst of um, um, basically transferring all the uh, lectures uh, into the online medium uh, in preparation that um, the, um, the university courses will actually be conducted online. So um, for universities that, that had uh, prepared themselves, um, they were able to execute. Um, there are universities out there as well at this moment in time that are still playing the catch up at this moment. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing for sure is that um, the delivery of the program online, the experience, uh, will also highlight the quality of the university. Um, if an international student experienced, uh, you know, uh, a, a very uh, positive experience learning online, um, communication um, with their lecturers, with their tutors, um, you know, and um, you know, if, if all those communications are positive, when the opportunity for them to actually resume face-to-face -face, uh, 
institution. I think um, you know the the overall reputation of the university will actually be further enhanced um, because at QS. Um, sorry, Samuel, uh, can I just ask in that context then? Um, do you think QS will be asking more questions about the quality of online courses or the quality of education? Because most of what the data you were talking to us about was more their, if you like, external experience, not their academic experience. So do you think there will be a change in the type of questions you're going to start asking, you know, to cover that kind of thing, the quality of online um, learning? And then secondly, um, this issue that students are gradually becoming warming up to the idea of online um, studying online, isn't that a bit ironic, given that the younger generation is much more adept to the online environment? So why, why, uh, why do you think, or what, what's your experience, you know, why do you think they are, they're hesitating to go this online route? Right. Um, okay, first and foremost, uh, to answer your first questions, um, I think in terms of uh, the QS uh, World University rankings, um, we have uh, essentially um, four main criteria when we evaluate um, what constitutes a world-class university. Uh, number one, um, research. Number two, teaching. Number three, internationalization. And number four, employability. So uh, since the start of, um, you know, QS delivering the World University Rankings Report, um, our methodology has not changed. And um, I think um, I would uh, say for, at least for now, um, there are no plans to change this uh, methodology to include uh, you know, online learning um, as part of uh, the, uh, the, the methodology in assessing the quality of uh, the university or even the reputation of the university. Um, however, um, within QS, itself, um, we have what we call the QS stars rating system, um, mm -hmm. where we basically um, audit an, a university according to a fixed set of uh, indicators um, set by QS. And uh, within this itself, um, we also evaluate um, the, uh, the university's capacity in delivering online um, education. So uh, for your second question in terms of uh, online versus face-to-face, -face, particularly for this new generation of uh, students, um, I think one thing you can't take away um, in terms of international education um, is, the, uh, is the experience of uh, living overseas, um, the experience of um, you know, networking, um, getting to know a new culture, um, for some countries in Asia, it is about picking up a new language altogether. Um, and I think um, all of these are, are factors um, that, um, that an online learning experience will not uh, be able to, uh, to contribute. Okay, I have some questions that have been sent in now, so I'm going to read them to you. This first one is from uh, Anthony Watering, who's actually uh, from Australia. He says, thank you, Samuel, for your presentation. Um, the data on prospective international students are very understandable and important when looking forward to enrollment rates. My university in Australia has negotiated with international students in regards to delaying immigration while continuing online learning in the meantime. I was wondering if you had encountered any data on this type of negotiation between prospective students and universities and how this type of cooperation might impact students' willingness to study abroad? Um, thanks, thanks, Anthony, for this question. Um, unfortunately, um, we have not um, gathered any data uh, relating to um, this, uh, you know, this, this particular question that you have asked, um, but you know, it is something uh, you know, that is very, very relevant uh, you know, in, in today's context. Um, because, uh, you know, international students, uh, you know, through this particular COVID crisis um, is looking at the possible delay of uh, one year or even more um, before they actually start their university uh, overseas. Um, personally, um, for myself, um, I'm based uh, here in uh, Singapore. Uh, I work out of the QS Intelligence Unit um, office um, in Singapore. 
And uh, I have actually seen for myself um, that uh, there are a number of uh, Singaporean students um, who were planning to go abroad at the start of the year had actually taken up local option uh, in Singapore. So uh, definitely, I think, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, the, the immigration issues uh, where um, countries um, have a travel ban restriction, uh, for international students, and this has actually made it a lot more difficult to travel abroad. Um, for students who are not prepared to wait, um, they will uh, definitely consider other uh, options, uh, perhaps online learning, perhaps a different um, education provider. I have another question here from Christoph. He's from uh, Hamburg. He's saying, do you, does QS, do you differentiate international students in terms of degree-seeking students and exchange students? If yes, um, uh, are there any significant differences? Right, for this particular survey, the answer is no. Um, mm. But of course, when we actually um, look at the QS uh, university rankings, um, when the university submit their data on uh, the number of international students, uh, then the answer is yes. Uh, you know, we will differentiate between uh, full-time uh, enrolled students versus exchange students. Okay, and this other question, um, I have a question related to this, but also we have one from Ahmed. Um, uh, he says, um, well, let me just preface this. Most of the respondents that you are talking about in your survey actually are going to Western or English speaking universities. They're coming from Asia or Southeast Asia or whatever, going to Western universities. but. Um, do you think there's going to be, are you going to try to balance this and actually look more at, you know, students who want to study in Asia? So this question here is, we are curious if the survey showed any interest from potential international students to study in Southeast Asia, especially Malaysia. I mean, what about this? Um, and the countries that you mentioned that had handled the coronavirus, all Western countries or, or English speaking countries, what about mm -hmm. Korea? You know, we're here in Korea and we, we have a great track record. So so where is that data? Can you balance that data? Are you going to be doing something about that? Right. Um, so let me answer this question in, in uh, two different parts. Uh, part one to this question will be in relations to the survey um, in response to the uh, coronavirus pandemic. Um, for this particular survey, um, you know, we are, we basically open up um, um, this to, to students from all over looking at, uh, you know, countries around the world. And uh, of course, um, the result that we have been given is, of course, uh, students wanting to go to more of the English-speaking countries. Um, but uh, let me just add that uh, we have what we call the International Student Survey, um, which we have, uh, you know, which is available um, on our website. And uh, this International Student Survey um, we'll actually provide data on students looking at studying pretty much in countries around the world, including Malaysia, including Korea, uh, and also um, through the uh, support of our QS analytics and consulting team, um, we have um, created uh, what we call a international student tracker, um, which is actually available through subscription. And um, this will allow universities to better understand and provide market intel on what international students are looking for when they are planning to study, for example, in Korea, right? So for example, at the university, um, where would be your possible low hanging fruits? So some people may have uh, split opinion, or oh, uh, maybe let's target uh, you know, the Western countries who might be interested in coming to Korea for exchange. Um, but where can you find um, students who are planning to come to do your one year, two year master's program or PhD program? Where are some potential uh, markets uh, that, um, that can support you with those students? So through our international student tracker, uh, we have gathered sufficient information making up of over 200,000 uh, responses. Um, of um, we can create a profile of a prospective student that will actually be able to uh, or would be interested in studying in, say, for example, KNU um, or, for example, uh, in Malaysia or in other countries. 
So, so that is the, the two part to, to answer this uh, specific question. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, Samuel, for that presentation and for your honest answers and, and for everybody for asking me questions. Good start. So now we have to move on to our uh, second speaker. So, thank yes, thank you. I'm being told to hold on here. Okay. Again, please send in your questions. They mean a lot to us. So then I don't have to use my questions. So our second speaker uh, is Vigneshri King from the University of Malaya located in Kuala Lumpur, the exciting capital city of Malaysia. Actually, uh, congratulations are in order for the University of Malaya as they just improved their QS world ranking to 59, amazing. And Asia ranking to 13, wonderful achievement, well done. And part of that success is certainly due to the work of our speaker, Vigneshri who is the director of the International Student Center, the ISC, at the University of Malaya, taking care of over 3,000 international students from over 80 countries. The ISC is an active intercultural hub. And I came across an interesting post on its Facebook page from earlier this year. Remember, we all used to gather like this, indeed. Everything has changed, so Vigneshri is here to share some of her strategies, such as the virtual summer school program and the online cultural activities, although it's really hard to enjoy those mooncakes online. <laughs> but I was especially happy to see the new photos of the ISC Global Buddies for this year, 2020, and I totally love the motto, live your life, embrace change. So to hear about these changes, I'm delighted to introduce Vigneshri King. Over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction, Mani. And um, thank you to KNU also for inviting me to speak in the conference. Um, so as uh, you are aware, COVID has forced mostly all the higher education institution across the globe to really think into a new way in uh, the teaching and online uh, teaching and learning processes. So I'm going to share with you today a few initiatives that University of Malaya has taken um, to face the current situation. Thank you. So let me start off with the internationalization team at University of Malaya. So we are headed by the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academic and International, Professor Dr. Kamila Ghazali. And she is ass uh, assisted by the Associate Vice Chancellor who looks into all the international affairs and the International Student Center directly falls under the Associate Vice Chancellor of International. So we've got actually four officers basically looking at the internationalization activities at University of Malaya. The International Relations Office, which looks into the partnerships. Uh, the International Student Center, looking into student mobility. The Marketing and Recruitment Center uh, looks into the uh, recruitment of uh, new students and also the Kongzi Institute. We also have the supports of the faculties and various academics and centers also helping in the internationalization agenda at the university. So basic, basically these are the core functions of the International Student Center, uh, which is managing the mobility program. We also design and promote short-term programs, summer programs. Uh, we manage the mobility funds uh, because we do provide funds to our students to participate in exchange programs and study abroad programs. We are also the custodian for data, whereby we provide data for the QS Asia ranking, world ranking. And if you can see here, my Mohes, Satara and Myra are all the national accreditation uh, uh, institutes that we need to provide data to. We also help in student capacity building, whereby we've got the ISC Global Buddies uh, assisting us uh, 
in welcoming inbound students to the university. Uh, we also have the UM International Student Association, which is led by a group of international full-time students. So this group of students um, look into providing assistance to international full-time students in the campus. We also have student support services looking into all the uh, support uh, advisors uh, and services that we can provide to international students. And we work in the, together with the International Relations Office in developing international networks and linkages. So let me take you through what has gone, uh, what has happened from January 2020 onwards. So from January to February 2020, of course, that was the initial stages of COVID-19. And uh, we had to put uh, through important announcements uh, to our partners, as well as our current students and future students who are coming to UM. Uh, we had to look into measures, steps, and to take actions to curb the COVID-19. Uh, we also had replacement of face-to-face to non-face-to-face -to, non -face -to -face teaching and learning activities. And we also looked into the guidelines of managing the COVID-19. And uh, March was the most important uh, time uh, whereby we went into total lockdown from 18 March onwards. Uh, and actually we started the online mood uh, learning beginning 16 March two days earlier to the lockdown. So students were all uh, studying online for that period. And this will go on up to end of uh, December, 2020. We had to look into alternative assessments uh, whereby uh, we did bring up a few papers to the Senate for approval in terms of having flexible assessments for the students for their final examination. Uh, grade I is something which was given to students uh, who would want to withdraw in between of the semester. If they were not too comfortable going through the online studies, they were able to withdraw for the semester without being, uh, without any penalty being, uh, they had didn't, didn't have to pay any penalty. So those were the flexible uh, flexibilities given to students in terms of uh, registration, post registration. As for the postgraduate students, we had uh, the thesis submissions were done online. And for the PhD students, the YWA was also conducted online. This was all something very new for us. And uh, we managed to conduct it successfully. Um, there were also alternative to internships and also teaching practices. We had to change the academic calendar uh, we moved the academic calendar a little later. We normally start from February and we end in June, but this time around we ended in July, end of July. And the new intake, which was normally, which normally starts in September, was moved to October. And we end in March next year, 2021. So basically, these were the things that uh, took part, uh, took place during uh, the uh, March to uh, September. Okay, as uh, despite the impact of the COVID-19 to the processes of the Higher Education Institute, there are also many positive things that were going on, such as UNESTI was investing more on technological infrastructure, uh, upgrade on services to meet the demands of the current situation. So one of it was the uh, training and resources that were provided to the staff uh, we, have, we have this Academic Development Center, ADEC, whereby they conduct many training sessions for the staff to ensure transition from face-to-face uh, -face teaching to online teaching. So there were many uh, faculties were, who were still unsure on how to go on uh, fully online mode. And um, this center came up with the online teaching and learning guideline which is a handbook, a guide for faculties to, uh, to come up with all the various teaching, uh, online teaching methods, uh, using various platforms, looking at different kind of assessments. And uh, this center has been uh, conducting many training programs up till now, even till today, there are training programs for staffs 
uh, on how to make them more comfortable using the uh, technology and to teach online. This was something new for my office, the International Student Centre, as the outbound and inbound program was suspended. Therefore, we had to look into new ways, new modalities for mobility. So we, one of it, of course, is the virtual program. So we came up with something, uh, a special lecture program. We wanted to try the market first because we were not sure how is the response is going to be from our partners. Therefore, we thought of starting off with something for maybe a very short program, starting off with a two hours lectures, lecture. So we took, uh, we looked into the theme of exploring Asia in the safest way from home. And uh, we did engage our experts from the Department of Southeast Asia and East Asia Studies. Um, and it was a free session for students uh, from our partner universities as well as non-partner universities. So how did we conduct the program was uh, we sent out the promotion through Facebook posting to Instagram posting. We also emailed to our partners and students. Um, we limited the participation to up to 600 students, but we also made the broadcast live through Facebook. And uh, registration was done through online registration. Students just had to fill up a Google form and students who completed the program successfully were given an e-certificate. And uh, it was also a, a good training platform for our staff because they were the technical team behind uh, managing this whole program online. And surprisingly, the, the, uh, we had a very good response from our friends, um, whereby we had a total of 584 participants registered and uh, from a total of nine different uh, universities, 94 different universities and uh, uh, about 20 plus uh, various countries. And uh, the breakdown is based on the day and the various topics. Those are the number of students participated. So this actually gives us a boost to, to come up with new programs because we also sent out a survey to the students uh, requesting them to highlight uh, what kind of programs that they would look in future. If UM is to offer any virtual programs, what kind of programs that they would like to have. So that gave us a good idea on uh, the type of programs that we should come out with, the structure of the program, even the duration of the program, because we were still not um, sure if we should have it for a two weeks or three weeks or just one week. So basically, uh, the survey did help us in getting uh, to plan our next program. As you know, the virtual engagement normally gets a bit, uh, students do get bored because li listening to lecture and then they do participate by asking questions. But we thought uh, to make it a little bit more fun by engaging our ISC global buddies to have uh, various activities for the students. So, so this was a bonus session for the students whereby they get to meet our global buddy, buddies online. And uh, there was cooking demonstration, uh, games played. So it was an interesting uh, session for the student. This was something we had uh, recently, which is our virtual orientation for the one semester exchange program. As I told you, we started the uh, semester in October, early October. So our virtual orientation was on 8th and 9th October. And uh, we had students from France, Germany, uh, Korea, Japan joining us for the exchange program. Uh, as the academic program is all going to be conducted online. So we had to bring them through the registration process. And also they also got engaged with a few activities uh, such as um, activities on the Malaysian culture. We also gave them a short long, um, uh, lecture on introduction to Malaysia. So this was also something very interesting that uh, we could see the engagement of the students, uh, both the local student as well as our international students. 
So this is something in the pipeline, a virtual short program. So based on the feedback that we got from our survey, so this is something that we have come up with, which is the entrepreneurial design thinking that we plan to have it in January 2021. And there are actually more programs in the pipeline and uh, we, we will be posting it in our website soon. This is another program which was in uh, collaboration with the other officers that are managing the internationalization uh, activities, which is the International Relations Office, the Center for Internship Training and Academic Enrichment, as well as the Marketing and Recruitment Unit, whereby we organize the International Webinar Series. So the topics covered were basically from internship topics uh, to, mob, to mobility, to partnerships, to uh, engaging um, with the embassies. So the next webinar will be on 28th of October. I would like to invite all of you all to join. So that's going to be on fostering bilateral relations for sustainable partnerships in higher education, whereby we'll be engaging with um, officers from the embassies to talk about the various uh, possibilities and um, activities that they are having during this situation. This is also something new for us, whereby we had the virtual internship day. Uh, as we were facing issues whereby students were not getting uh, placement, internship placement due to companies were not accepting them physically during this uh, situation. Therefore, we had to come up with a virtual internship day whereby we invited uh, companies to come online and meet and interact with our students. So this was something very successful whereby we had a total of uh, 64 companies uh, coming online and the other remaining companies were there to receive students application, job application, as well as um, internship application. So if you could see a total of 1,799 e-meetings were conducted on the virtual internship day. So companies had a Zoom link for students to click on to meet with their HR personnel of the company, chat with them to find out more on the company and also be interviewed at the same time. And we, were all, we also had some students who got job offers on the same day. So this is something very new and I think it, it is a successful uh, program. Uh, it's not only um, meeting the companies, but there were also some interesting topics whereby uh, we had uh, companies, industries sharing uh, various talks on such as building interviewing skills, getting the most out of your internship, preparing to be a job seeker. So these were some of the inter interesting topics that were shared by the industry. I'm sure all of our other partners will also be doing the same thing, which is virtual meeting with partners. So we have been conducting virtual meetings uh, together with our partners. And this is basically headed by the International Relations Office. And uh, we do come in and to provide information on mobility programs. And up till now, we have conducted uh, about 76 online meetings with our partners. And uh, one of the things that we normally discuss with our partners is to come up to come up with shared courses, whereby um, we would like our partner to um, sh uh, identify courses that they can teach that can be shared with students in UM. At the same time, UM will also share the courses that we think would be uh, that the faculties could engage with our partners. Okay. And also there are also introduction to the digital signature for the MOU signing purpose. We also have the marketing and recruitment center, which is uh, whereby they are in charge of the recruitment of new students to the university. And as you are aware, that is one of the challenges that we are facing now, which is the international student recruitment uh, and, and enrollment. 
And this unit has also conducted various webinars whereby they bring in experts from the faculty to talk about their programs, as well as to reach out to potential students uh, on various topics too, whereby there were topics on how to write a good research proposal, uh, on the scholarships available for students. So I think these are basically some of the interesting topics that this, this unit um, shared uh, through their webinar series. This is also an ongoing program because um, education fairs and all is not something possible to for us to attend now. Everything is being done virtually. So this is the initiative from the university side. So this is something very close to our heart, which used to be, if you can see the photos there, those were the, uh, this was taken uh, last year, November, whereby we had our UM International uh, Cultural and Food Festival, which is known as UMICAF. Uh, we organize this program every year in end of November, and it is a three to four days event whereby we get students to share their culture, their cuisine, uh, we have various kinds of activities for the campus community. So what we thought that we don't want to miss it this year due to COVID, we will still have it, but we are going to do it virtually. And it's going to be the UMI week 2020. Uh, we are planning to have it from 23rd to 27th November. And this is an open invitation to everyone uh, who is watching us today to please be part of this international week because it's totally free. And basically we are going to have three kinds of activities, which is the study abroad opportunities, whereby you get to know about UM's inbound program, uh, the full-time programs. It's just not the programs offered by UM, but you also get a chance to meet our partners. They will be sharing their programs to whatever programs that they're offering. There's going to be a talk on various scholarship opportunities. There's going to be an online education exhibition. We also have the POSCO awarding ceremony. This is a POSCO is a steel company from Korea and basically they award our students with scholarship every year for the study about program. So we will be having this ceremony also. And there's also the Asian ASEAN University Network Korean Youth Summit is also going to be organized during this duration. Uh, we also have the under the cultural exchange, uh, students will get to learn new languages. There's going to be several workshops on dance, arts, culinary. Um, there's going to be various competitions on knowledge sharing. We've got a special lecture, a few special lectures as well as uh, international staff training. It's, it's something free. So I would, this is an open invitation to all of you all. Okay, so we will share the details in our website soon for this program. So way forward, these are the things that we are looking into uh, to encourage more participation in online learning, which is the mock courses, uh, micro-credentials, uh, looking into enhancing our technical support, as for to enhance digital marketing and recruitment ac activities, we are working towards the virtual expos and webinars. Uh, we are also going to upgrade the website so it's more user friendly. Um, there are going to be more scholarship and financial aid schemes for the students. On enhancing our collaboration with potential partners, uh, we are looking into joint supervision, shared courses, virtual summer programs, of course, the series of webinars, and for the ongoing exercises would be also the faculty KPIs. We have to look into how to uh, look into putting all these virtual things into their KPI because faculties are also working very hard uh, in terms during this situation under the curriculum review to also see into how you can fit in virtual mobility into that, that structure. And also to review the UM core processes in teaching and learning as well as internationalization. So basically that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Vigneshri. I think you really are understood the title of today's conference, Maximizing 
maximizing the uh, new normal, definitely. Um, I'm going to start, though, with a bit of a basic question here, and, and actually not an easy one. But given the uncertainty, numerous risks, physical and mental, and the financial investment, do you think that universities should be encouraging students to travel right now, both inbound and outbound? What do you think? Well, yeah, that's <laughs> of course we would love to accept students, but unfortunately, yeah, we don't want to put them in risk. Okay, so based on the risk and based on, I think each country has got their own way of assessing the risk. Uh, and I don't think this is the right time for them to travel, okay? And I think there are many platforms for students to explore mobility now through the virtual mobility and maybe explore the virtual mobility first and when things get fine and then you can come physically. We are more than happy to welcome them later. But with the current risk, we don't want to endanger students' lives. And uh, I'm sure the parents of the students will also be worried to send them. That's true. Absolutely. Okay, we have a question here from Yumino. She, uh, they say, hello, Vigneshri, please could you let us know what your main findings were from the survey you sent for future summer schools? So I they want more details. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I, I'm sure that will also help you to come out with a program mm -hmm. for your students. So basically, students were interested in cultural programs. Okay, and uh, it also depends when the students are coming from certain region, they are looking more into language. Okay, when we have participants from China, from Korea and Japan, they, they want something to do with language, English language. Okay. So you can look into courses uh, offering short programs on language, English language, on uh, communication, okay? But basically, um, the interest was more into culture, religion, business, and economy. Basically, this was the four top things. Yeah. Okay. Um, about your ISC Global Bodies, um, do you have any special training for these students? And do you actually have a report system so you can monitor or evaluate their actual activities? Yes. Um, this group of students, of course, they are, they, are, they are selected based on an interview done. And uh, it's basically on uh, more voluntary, okay? Their services are all voluntary done. And... Um, come again it's how do i evaluate is it how do you evaluate are they actually active as bodies i mean do you actually ask them to report do you monitor what they do how many times they interact are they given an individual student to talk to what what, what kind of evaluation system do you use or do you use one yes that there, there is an evaluation because during the interview we do tell them that they will be evaluated based on the activities that they conduct for their bodies and uh, there is a certain minimum requirement that they have to handle this many activities in a semester and then report to us. But basically, we do have an officer in charge at the International Student Center looking, looking into all the activities organized by the buddies. And we provide them support in terms of funding to conduct the activities. So normally, they have to go through us if they are planning to do any activities for the uh, exchange students. And um, um, we also let them to, we have certain set of programs that we have by conducted by our office, but we also leave them to organize their own activities. We have students taking them to their hometown to experience the culture back at their hometown. So those are things which they do it separately. It's not in a structured program. Okay, but all will be reported to the office. Um, this is another question about the um, online learning that you've maybe noticed. Um, Asian students are known to be more quiet in classes. So do you think that online classes have helped individual students to engage more? I think that there, there should be various kind of assessment used, okay? If it's just going to be a lecture and students just uh, 
questioning after the lecture. Of course, you will have this group of students who is not going to ask any question and a group who is going to be very active. So I think with, as I told you, there has been a guideline for how to conduct online courses. So there's various kind of assessment. So it's not necessary, uh, it can be group work, a small group work, and then the assessment can be based on the participation of each student. There could be a group leader looking into all of these uh, activities that is being done. So I think uh, it can be managed and uh, by coming up with various different activities, it's not necessary a lecture, but you have various kind of assessment a group presentation or just a, a quiz, those kind of things, different kind of activities will encourage the students to participate, participate more. Okay, I have a, an anonymous um, question here. Um, for your webinar series organized by UN Marketing Recruitment Center to tap potential students to come to your university, may we know who you invited to participate in the seminar in order to attract potential students to your university, especially the international students? Okay, basically the intention was to promote the programs that we have at the university, the various programs. So there were representatives from all the faculties. So just, we have got the faculty of business and accountancy. So we would invite an expert from the faculty to talk about the various programs that they offer and then if the next faculty we have another expert okay and also the as i told you there are also additional topics on how to write your research proposals uh, and also the scholarships available so we diff we invite uh, individuals from respective units to to give the talk okay another one now this one is about the virtual internship day it sounds really great what was the feedback from the companies and did it lead to actual online internships you talked about some job offers but but did it what were the actual results from that day okay as for online uh, internship it is also something very new for all the companies also okay so they are working for it for the coming semester nothing has been done for this semester but they are looking into it for the next semester the, as I told you, the participation from the companies have been very good, as well as from the students itself. But uh, there is no any current virtual internship going on for the current semester. Okay. Yeah. Um, here's a question. What's your biggest frustration right now? <laughs> uh, okay, I would say not seeing the students. Yes, not seeing my international students. I don't get to see because this um, normally the September intake is our biggest intake. We used to get up to 600 exchange students. And this time around, we are just dealing with just 30 students. And that is really frustrating. But I'm still happy. We still have the 30 students with us online. But we hope that this COVID will end soon and we get to meet them in person soon. And um, I have one last question. Um, have you thought about using a learning management system or gamification options to engage student learning? I'm not so sure what learning management. The idea that you know many companies do this to um, onboard their employees to help with their their training. Um, it's an online management, so it's completely uh, online. And they gamify it, so they make it like you get badges and you you know you make it into a game. It's it's a big thing now for corporate education. So I'm just mm. wondering if you've thought about this in terms of an academic environment. Um, we have Obviously yet to not. think about that. <laughs> we are trying to do something interesting during our international week, uh, mm -hmm. whereby uh, we would like students to participate in the various workshop and. Uh, that will entitle them to take part in various competitions. And we are offering prizes up to 20,000 USD. So Ooh, wow. that's one way we hope that mm. we can attract students to come and join us when everything is possible. Um, I've got one last uh, question here um, for you, Alia Al Elias. 
How do you find the students who join virtual mobility? Did they enjoy and engage well during the session? How do you design a virtual program that is more engaging and fun too? I think you were almost just talking about that. But anyway, last question. What's the design remit that you use? Okay, I think firstly, you need to define the learning goals for your virtual program. What do you really want your participant to know to get out of the program? So then you think about the activities, the structure of the program, the activity plans, different kind of activity plans. It just can't be just a lecture. You have to engage them with various activities. Uh, you also have to, if you're looking at different partners, you want to join with a different partner, you have to look at someone who can, can a partner who can contribute to the project and a partner that, um, something that if you if you just say I'm going to work with KNU on a project on a short term program uh, short term project our academic calendar should match our time zones should match so that it makes things much more easier and I think um, you need to also identify a proper platform to be used because there are certain platforms which can't be used at uh, the some countries, so that that's a thing, okay. okay. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, also, you have to facilitate a meaningful experience so that um, the students can uh, engage themselves and um, do various activities and exchange, uh, have a dialogue. So I think uh, putting in various activities into the program will make it more interesting than rather just having a, a, a structured, a normal lecture kind of program. Great, well, thank you, Vishnu Shri. It was great to have your uh, maximizing you. uh, the new normal, definitely. And I think everybody has learned a lot from that. So thank you. And now I'm going to switch to our final speaker. So our final speaker is Dustin Waters the International Programs Advisor for the Office of International Affairs here at Kimbok National University. KNU is the top national university in South Korea with a world ranking of 99, according to the Times Higher Education Ranking List. Sorry, Samuel, we need to work on our QS ranking. So KNU is located in the Southeast of the Korean Peninsula. As you can see here, in the modern and traditional city of Daegu. However, earlier this year, Daegu became globally infamous as the second epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak with the world seeing pictures like this. Plus Daegu is where the first drive-through coronavirus testing was used. But thankfully due to strict monitoring and ongoing quarantine rules, Korea now has very low numbers of COVID-19 and KNU just started its fall semester. By the way, these are some of my photos actually of the beautiful fall colors from the KNU campus. Some things have not changed. So to share some of the key experiences and strategies of how KNU Office of International Affairs has weathered and stayed active during the past year, protecting its partnerships around the world and taking care of its international students. I'm delighted now to hand over to Dustin. All right, <laughs> thank you very much for that introduction. And those are some great uh, pictures that you found there. Um, also, I wanna say thank you to Samuel and thank you to Vignashree for uh, speaking before me. I really learned a lot from uh, both of those presentations. Um, let me go ahead and uh, share my screen. Okay. Um, today, I'm going to be speaking about continued internationalization amid the pandemic. Business as unusual. Uh, okay. So the content here, I want to stress before I, I start that uh, some of these things are new processes for old procedures, and some of these are completely new opportunities that came out of the chaos of the pandemic. And um, unlike the University of Malaya, we're a very centralized uh, international office. 
And all of the things that I'm about to talk to you about uh, was a team effort uh, from the dean at the top, all the way down to the team manager to us boots on the ground. Um, even the content of this presentation was compiled and put together by the team. So I'm just the person who gets to tell you about it. Uh, the first thing uh, once when the pandemic hit was uh, we couldn't travel. And in fact, many of us in the international office at Kenya were abroad uh, as it was starting to become really bad in Daegu. We flew back into the middle of a raging pandemic here. And it was really clear that we weren't going to be traveling for a while. And like the University of Malaya, we started doing uh, online Zoom meetings. Uh, you can see here at the bottom of my screen, here's the meeting that we had with the University of Malaya. You can see um, Vignashree there uh, in the chat on the top left. I noticed that uh, they had the same uh, meeting, uh, one of their pictures in their presentation. So that was nice to see what it looked like from the other side. Uh, we've done 53 meetings so far and we keep doing them. We plan to keep doing them. We like we like how it uh, feels. It's great to be able to meet from home. And also it really is an opportunity to meet more people than you normally would. Even, even if you're not going to huge conferences, being able to meet personally with four to five schools uh, every week really gives you a chance to put a face to the name of people that you've been talking to. And um, one of the great things that we've also seen from this experience is learning about uh, new programs. And one of those programs um, we call COIL. It goes by other names. And uh, before I go too much further here, I'd like to uh, ask you to uh, take a second. You should see a poll pop up there on your screen. Um, I'd like to ask you to uh, take a second to uh, read through these questions and, uh, and give us an answer. Uh, so the first one there is your university currently engaged in COIL, uh, collaborative international, collaborative online international learning. It goes by other names, uh, but just for the sake of this presentation, um, I'm going to stick with COIL because that's what we know it by here. Um, but if you've uh, taken part in other similar activities also, please just check yes. Um, the second question there is, do you plan to engage in COIL? Um, yes or no, or, or perhaps you don't know quite enough yet to, to be decided. Um, and then um, the last question we have there is, at what level would you be interested in engaging in COIL? Undergraduate, graduate, or both? So um, take a second, click through the answers. I'm not allowed to vote, um, but uh, I'll give it a few more seconds and then I'll, I'll ask, um, the man running our tech right now to uh, upload the uh, results. And there you have it. Okay, so it looks like slightly, slightly under uh, two thirds have still not uh, engaged in COIL classes, and that's that's fine. That's what we would that's what we would expect. We're, it's uncharted territory here. We're we're in the new normal, so we wouldn't expect everybody to be doing all of the new normal things quite yet. Um, do you plan on engaging? It looks like a, a pretty strong mix between yes and we don't know. Again, uh, very understandable. I, I like to see those yeses. Um, and then the last one, undergraduate, graduate, or both. Okay, um, so I'm gonna close this. I'm gonna make sure we have these results saved. We'll, we'll save them for our records. Um, but uh, uh, COIL, uh, despite the graphic there on the screen, doesn't need to be 50-50. Kind of any, any classroom that has two or more professors from two or more countries ideally uh, counts as COIL. COIL as we know it um, originated in SUNY, which is the State University of New York. We first came to know about it through San Jose State University. And subsequently we've talked to Coventry and, and other partners. But if you're interested in, in COIL projects, uh, let us know, we'd, we'd like to, to, to do more with it. Um, as you would imagine, COIL relies upon professors, um, professor, inter-professor relationships. It's not easy for the administration to just say, hey, 
professors run a COIL class. So um, we need uh, professors to really know each other. And, um, and uh, part of that is uh, um, signing MOUs. So we've been continuing to uh, branch out and reach out to more partners um, through MOUs, uh, just like we did before the pandemic. Uh, we've been doing it uh, during, uh, and a, a big thanks to the, the Zoom video chats where we've been able to speak to new prospective partners and um, keep uh, the ball rolling. We plan to, to keep that up as well. So um, if you've yet to uh, sign a partnership with KNU, let us know and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, get a chat uh, scheduled here. We can start exploring. Um, uh, another way to kind of get professors to know each other historically has been the Visiting Scholar Program, um, where a professor from a partner university or a prospective partner university would come to KNU and teach a three uh, week course uh, here on campus. Uh, we would pay for the round trip airfare, we'd pay for accommodation while they were here, uh, we'd provide accommodation. Um, and we give them a $2,500 stipend once it was over. Um, the benefit of doing that is that uh, our, that you can, the professors here can see our students, see our campus and go spread the, the good word back home. Uh, hopefully uh, increasing um, interest in KNU, but also um, professors are able to meet other professors here. So unfortunately right now, uh, we weren't able to run the Visiting Scholar program this summer, but we are going to do it an online version of it this winter. And then hopefully going forward, we'll be able to go back uh, to a face-to-face -face where people are actually traveling. And then uh, through that, hopefully professor to professor relationships can uh, build and we can start seeing more and more COIL projects uh, starting up. Um, that's kind of some internal stuff. I kind of want to pivot now to uh, programs that we have put on for partner students. And uh, like the University of Malaya, uh, we also had an online course. And I was happy to hear uh, one of the follow-up questions was about it uh, from Yumino there at York St. John. Um, so it seems like uh, these online courses, short courses, do have a lot of interest. And when we've talked to partners about our experience, it's always been um, met with a lot of interest. So ours, ours was a little smaller than the University of Malaya's. Ours was only 34 students, but we had students from America, Europe, Asia. Uh, it only cost about $200. Uh, and we, we accredited it. We credited it. We gave uh, three credits. Uh, for attending the course. Um, it was very interactive because of the smaller class size. Uh, the first two hours were focused on Korean language and without, um, without kind of, we, we made it a very introductory level of uh, Korean language so that we could kind of aid uh, the most broadest uh, group of students. Um, so the first two hours, we had one of our um, Korean language teachers, as you can see there in the middle picture, uh, teach a basic Korean. And then the last two hours, the final two hours, we did cultural uh, stuff, culture classes. And this is where it really got interesting. We had our Korean student ambassadors, which are KNU students, lead uh, these culture classes where they did everything from, they did a cooking class so kind of a, a, um, a taste, a virtual taste test. They did um, clothing, Korean hanboks. They did, uh, they did a talent show. Um, one, of the, one of my favorite ones that they did was some of our staff members took cameras to uh, nearby cities, uh, Busan and Gyeongju, and shot film of a, of a tour. And then the students could relive that um, experience, thanks to the the effort done by the our students and staff, um, that was very interesting. And we even uh, at the end we mailed out um, souvenirs, so they got they got a little bit of physical um, memory from their online experience. Um, the feedback from it was overwhelmingly positive. Um, students uh, cited a, it was a great chance to see Korea despite not being able to travel. It was cost effective, it was only $200. Um, it was safe in regards to COVID. 
and uh, they had a good time. It was fun. And uh, many of them said that uh, thanks to this experience, they are now planning to visit Korea as a result. So overwhelmingly positive and off of the positive reviews, we're planning to offer this class again in the winter. Um, so it, we will be updating uh, our partners about uh, that uh, program. Um, but if you have any added interest or you feel like you really wanna know more, uh, let us know and we'll keep you in the loop about that. So we also have programs uh, designed for our students. Uh, much of it was in the form of information sessions and Q&A sessions. You can see there at the top right, I hope my face isn't blocking the, the magnificent poster we put together um, for one of our Q&A sessions on our international programs. Uh, I actually personally found this to be a little bit more helpful than the traditional information sessions, um, mostly due to the fact that we could get to every question uh, at the end. We could, we could say exactly what we wanted to say uh, as per normal, but what was different from an auditorium is that when it was done, instead of students filing out with a few staying back behind to ask questions, we could ask for questions in the chat box and students uh, would stay until their question was answered. If they had a follow-up, they could answer, they could ask it there. And we could just sit back and field these questions and make sure everybody's questions was addressed. Um, so that was that was a benefit. That was something new. And 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 I, I would say personally that's something I think we may want to consider keeping um, in the future, even if we are able to go back to an auditorium. Um, we were able to target some more specific programs like the double degree uh, program. It's a, a little less uh, widely understood here on campus, um, but we've, we've seen some increased interest uh, because of these information sessions. There's the visiting uh, scholar program uh, there as well. And the, the, the pre-exchange program where students are really just kind of on the fence about going abroad. So a semester or two before they would actually go, we're starting to um, mentor them with students that are coming back from their student experience, from their study abroad experience, um, kind of placing them in strategic classes where they get their writing up to snuff uh, to head abroad or their, or their language, English language skills up to snuff. Um, so all of these, um, all of these programs that we have for our local students, we had to put those online as well. Um, but we found that they ran uh, very well. Um, so I was impressed with that. Um, one of the difficulties we had, ooh, that star there, was uh, the Korean government has been taking COVID very seriously. Thank goodness, we like that. Um, but regardless of where you're coming from, anybody entering Korea was required to do a two-week self-isolation or quarantine upon arrival. And there are many, there were several options. One was a government option that ran about $1,400. One, you could find an Airbnb or, or a buddy and stay at their place. But KNU offered to its exchange students and its double degree students and its degree seeking students, um, one of our dormitories um, for uh, quarantine. And um, that was quite the undertaking. Um, I won't get into all of it right now uh, for lack of time, um, but now that it's over, we can reflect on it and, and uh, see uh, the great things that it did for our students. It really made their lives so much easier. Um, upon arrival at Incheon Airport, uh, they were, assuming they had their student uh, visa, which they all did, they, they must have before arriving in Korea, they were given government transportation down to this city, Daegu. Uh, upon arrival in Daegu, they were given a COVID test and then somebody from the Office of International Affairs, myself or one of our other staff members, chaperoned them to um, the dorm, uh, saw them into their room. Um, they had supplies. You can see in the, the pictures here, we had truckloads of supplies, of, you know, toiletries, water, snacks. Um, we catered to dietary needs. Uh, we had a we had a chat room uh, going, so the students were able to to chat with each other, uh, provide uh, support for each other, request uh, necessities, 
if they ran out of soap, for example, they could uh, put it in the chat that they needed more soap. And one of us would go uh, daily to the dorms and, and make sure they were well taken care of. Um, uh, one of the things that we did, you can see there with the star, was the mental upkeep. We set up uh, almost every other day, if not every other day, then twice a week, um, uh, activities for them to do via Zoom, where we we toured the campus with them, we showed them what they what awaits them once they're out of their quarantine. Or we uh, we did uh, restaurant reviews, um, and we even played uh, we played games. Uh, we for the games, uh, one of the uh, one of the games we did was a trivia, trivia, Korean language trivia game, and we awarded prizes to the top uh, 10, 20 uh, students who won. Oh, it was a bingo game. So the, the first, however many, 15 students that got bingo got a Starbucks, and then we took their Starbucks order, and we, we went to the dorm and delivered, uh, you know, 15, 20 Starbucks to these students who had won, and we were greeted by some students with tears of joy after after days and days of eating, uh, you know, Korean food, which um, to some of them they had never had before, understandably, may get a little old after day uh, 12 <laughs> of no other option. Uh, but yeah, we were met with some tears of joy being able to eat uh, eat a biscuit and uh, drink some uh, Starbucks. So we, we found uh, the response from the students to be, um, really positive and kind of kept us going through it because it, it was no easy task uh, from our part. Um, but I'll, I'll skip over that for now and move on to uh, another student service that we had to put online. We have an international writing center. I know many of you have international writing centers at your schools. Ours operates also as a service um, providing our outbound students, our potential outbound students, an opportunity to go through what we call a writing roadmap that was set up by the director, uh, David. You can see him pictured in the right uh, picture there on the right. Um, uh, David has set up a writing roadmap that prepares students for success in, in English writing uh, upon them traveling abroad. And so, he had actually already made an online version of this writing roadmap uh, at the end of 2019 or during 2019 that was set up strictly for students who were in Korea physically um, uh, too far away from Daegu. Maybe they were, they were in Seoul or another city and it coming all the way here just to do this writing roadmap was a little much. Um, so he had an online version ready to go thinking this was gonna serve us 10 to 20 students, and it ended up servicing every single outbound student, um, which I can get into those numbers a little bit later, wasn't as many as has been historically, has been historic because of the pandemic, but uh, nonetheless, every single student uh, that did the writing roadmap did it online. You can see that middle picture is um, one of our tutors uh, performing that task. Our tutors here are our inbound students, uh, either from native English speaking countries or who have demonstrated an English capability high enough to be an English tutor. And those tutors are awarded internship credits and, and uh, pay. So depending on how many hours they do here, they may receive uh, pay, they may receive credits. Um, but it's a real great, great way of having the outbound students interact with the in the inbound students, and then both can uh, go along their way. It's been a really successful program, and uh, switching it to online was not uh, wasn't it was successful. It was, it was a I would I would label it a success. And uh, you can see on the third picture there, uh, that's how it, we plan to have it look once we're able to have it back here in the writing center. Once we're able to have students come back. I don't know if you can see very clearly, but there's plexiglass uh, in between the two. There's no paper being um, being exchanged. Everything's done online. Uh, the, the submitting, the grading and all that is done. Uh, but, but at least soon, hopefully we can go back to face-to-face. -to -face. Um, we also uh, had some of the interns uh, lead online information sessions. So the online information sessions that I spoke of earlier for our local students, um, we had our interns lead some of those sessions, and that was really 
that was really fun <laughs> to see them do that. Um, the last thing uh, that I'd like to mention in terms of things that we've done during the pandemic uh, were these conferences, the new normals conferences, and we've enjoyed uh, doing them. They've been a lot of work, but they've been extremely rewarding. We've learned a lot. We've been able to interact with a lot of our partners. We've been able to to, to see them and, and keep kind of the conversation going, maintain um, some relevance on the, the world stage of uh, international exchange. And uh, if we do another one, uh, we look forward to seeing you there. Um, so in conclusion, uh, we're here and we're here to, we're, we're continuing to operate uh, the best that we can. We're, we're trying to maximize this new normal in so far as continuing our old uh, operations in, in this new format, but also trying to look for opportunities to do something new uh, uh, given this new background uh, reality. So um, if you're interested in uh, Zoom chats with us, let us know. COIL, MOUs, our online short program, uh, or our visiting scholar, or anything else, anything else, let us know. My email is there at the bottom of the page. I'm a perfectly fine person to email about this. Um, uh, go ahead and watch that YKNU video if you want. Uh, from all of us at KNU, uh, thank you for uh, taking part in this conference and listening to uh, our presentation that I was so lucky to be able to give. That is the end of my time. I'm gonna hand it back now to Mrs. Huang for the Q&A. And do I need to stop sharing my screen? Way to, way to go, Dustin. All right, good job. Um, so I've got a kind of a similar question for you to start with, with uh, the nursery is, um, do you think it's good for students to travel overseas? So obviously you were welcoming a lot of students here. Did they, why did they come to Korea? Was it because Korea's reputation for taking care of the pandemic has, has been good? Or, you know, this was something was addressed with the QS, uh, speaker well, what do you what do you think were the reasons that they came given that it's you know worldwide right now a, a kind of difficult choice to make yeah i was actually thinking about that when you asked uh Vignashri. um i thought she gave a really great answer um i would i would kind of come at it from two angles one angle is i would say what we did we officially recommended students not travel but we left the channels open if them or their parents wanted to take advantage of it we didn't we didn't dictate that they were not allowed to go um, but we did recommend that they that they defer um, in terms of our inbound students i think i think i would use that as an as kind of my second way of approaching this depending on the country uh, there were diff the international offices responded differently. So Korea, a lot of Korean uh, universities like us remained open. And I think that that reflects somewhat on the level of seriousness that Korea uh, took towards COVID. I know many universities, I'm from the United States. Um, and so my home country, the United States, COVID has hit it slightly harder than it's hit Korea. And um, many universities that we're partners with in the States shut their programs down completely. So I think those responses are both perfectly acceptable responses. Ultimately, I would say it is a, an individual um, decision, individual to the office and individual to the person traveling. Um, but I would say definitely take note of the country you're traveling to and possibly the country you're traveling from and then um, error on the side of caution. Uh, but if you are coming to Korea, you are you are coming into a comparably safer country. I have a question now, a, a, an anonymous question, but it's uh, the culture classes sound fun. Could you discuss how you think they can introduce students to KNU, not only Korea? Um, I think that uh, definitely the fact that we use our own KNU students to run the cultural portion of the class um, gave a very good introduction to uh, KNU. Now, those are just the ambassadors, um, but 
uh, the ambassadors uh, clearly represent KNU as a as a larger whole, and uh, uh, even to the point, you know, after doing two weeks of daily two hour activity with these uh, ambassadors from KNU, from our actual students, at the end during the farewell ceremony, there were tears. Students uh, students from abroad were. <laughs> Yeah, they were remorseful. They weren't going to be able to keep up this relationship with our students. So our students um, advertised our our school very, very well. I, I'm immensely proud of what they did and how they represented KNU. In the future, we may do more uh, campus tours, campus specific tours. Um, but our focus really wasn't necessarily on advertising KNU so much. We we had them already. We had them as our students right now. And we were we were using our platform to to show off uh, Korea as a larger whole, um, but uh, definitely through through our lens. And so, uh, assuming that the students resonated with the KNU students that guided their tour, I think uh, that that was a great way of of showing KNU to to those students. Okay, we've got quite a few questions that have come in about Coil. So this first one here is from uh, Wim at uh, Winsheim, uh, University of Applied Sciences, um, the Netherlands. My idea is to let small projects, groups of students of three or four institutes on weekdays in Korea, US and the Netherlands, and maybe a fourth institute too. Um, every day there's a transfer stand up from and to the next group at the beginning and end of the day by lecturers and all participants. Um, if traveling would be possible again, after a while students could go visiting one of the participants for a real meeting, um, which is one of our, uh, for delivering the products. What about this idea? I love it, great, great idea. Let's do it. Um, okay, next the, one. <laughs> okay, go for it, yeah. <laughs> because we're running out of time and you've got a lot of questions. So, so hold me. Okay, okay, go for it, yeah. Yeah, Justin, so. thanks Thanks for your lecture. I guess many universities canceled their plan for summer school or short-term programs this year, but many still have some offers virtual program, including the cultural program like you, your university. Lecture or language course could work even online, but my concern is cultural programs or activities are very limited with this non-face-to-face -face type. Could you share um, more on the feedback, positive or negative? Also, any tips to make next programs better? Uh, more on the feedback, I don't really have more. It was overwhelmingly positive. We did a lot of cultural stuff, two hours a day, every single day for two weeks. Um, a tip, I would say, keep it to a smaller class size. Uh, once you get larger class, you lose kind of some of the interactivity. Some students fall, some students, some of the quieter students may not speak up. So kind of without without making it ridiculously small, kind of the smaller it is, the more interactivity you get, and that leads to engagement and makes it more interesting for everybody involved. Uh, a question here from uh, Kyung Lee Park. Does the core program differ from the double degree? Yes, the double degree program is where a student will spend some number of years at their home university, some number of years at the host university and receive diplomas from both. The COIL program is, is based around single classes or courses. It is one class room wherein two professors are feeding into the lecture. So there, there, is, there, there really is not very much overlap other than it's multicultural. Okay. They're both multicultural. Um, as shown in the QS survey, communication with students is the key. So would you say your communication with students has improved? due to the COVID pandemic? And how have students communicated with the OIA? Has this changed and has this increased? I would say the communication with students has increased noticeably. We are, by doing it online, we are able to reach students at their convenience and we are able to hit all of their individual concerns through the Q, just by the virtue of having that little chat box on, on the side, like what we're doing right now. I'm able to get to much more questions now I could theoretically get to every single questions if, if we didn't have a, a time limit on, on the backside. So we uh, definitely are able to engage uh, more students and be accessible to more students in that regard. Um, now, have you seen any 
hidden benefits for international and Korean students from the COVID-19 crisis? Any hidden benefits? <laughs> uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of any really interesting answer to that. I, I think perhaps being able, the youth know how to use technology and right. now technology is what is running the world. So um, I, I think that there, there is naturally some apprehensive, apprehension about changing anything really to go from the traditional to the modern is, is, is tricky, is scary perhaps. But I think you, you're seeing young people now really embrace it and take over this new platform and I think that they're they're running strong with it in, in terms of like classroom online classes. I think they're they're learning as much as they were before, but doing it in a much less stressful way, doing it at their own leisure. They're able to interact if they're doing coil classes, or um, uh, or, or interacting with other students from other countries. Otherwise, um, they're doing it much more conveniently. So. So I don't know. I mean, I don't think that we will go back to how it was before. I don't think there is a time to go back to. I think we are going to take the good from before and we're going to take the good from now and blend it and go forward. And it's going to be, I think, despite all the, the terrible events that have taken place and how difficult it was, I think it, it will ultimately lead to some uh, very big positives. And in this idea of using technology, what do you think about the idea of learning management systems or gamification? I asked Big, big Neshri about this, but this is a big thing now, an opportunity like Zoom has become, you know, the big thing, but learning management systems also, this idea of making everything into things where you get promoted or bonuses or rewards. Or, I mean, you're already doing that, but can we do more of that, do you think, in the education or the internationalization um, aspect? Yeah, I would kind of... I would start that answer by saying um, uh, the caveat is as long as the education level remains, mm -hmm. then everything else is positive. And, and we heard from our, our last conference that we did from Professor Troy Furham, he was talking about some of the utilities that come with an online classroom um, being better than, than what he had before. And he's planning to keep them uh, even once he goes back into the classroom. Um, so I, uh, I really strongly feel that um, going forward, there's going to be uh, big, big positives. I, I, I forgot the, the first half of your question there. <laughs> anyway, that's all right. Any, any, um, do you have any main frustrations right now that, that you're dealing with? I mean, would you do again what you just did with all those students coming in for the, the quarantine? Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a, a major interdepartmental exercise for the whole university to be honest yes it, it's it's i would say it's been more work we, we're more busy now than we were before uh, right. even even if we're doing uh, sometimes we'll do half days at home uh just to, to keep people out of the office to, to keep social distancing measured even so we're, we're we're very busy we we do all the traditional things and then we have to overcome kind of the new learning process um in terms of something that I, I miss or, I, or, I, or I, I, I miss the outbound students uh, coming through the office. There's not too many outbound students. We, we, we took a hit on that. We recommended that they don't go outbound. So they were heeding our advice, thank goodness. But we had a, we had a lot of inbound students. We, had, we quarantined 140, something like that, students. So wow. the, the inbound students are here, not 100% not of what it used to be, but a lot of them um, but I think personally, what I miss is, and this, this is going to sound ridiculous, I think many people would disagree with me, but I miss the energy of those huge conferences of the EAIE and NAFSA. There was just uh, overwhelming buzz energy in those rooms, and it was go, 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 figure it out. So I do personally miss that, but that is extremely, that isn't it an extremely selfish answer. Um, I, the no, the students- So we, we haven't created that buzz today, you don't think? <laughs> <laughs> Not quite, right? I, I was a little nervous. I was a little nervous doing this, but uh, man, nothing gets me going like those conferences, just bouncing from person to person. Okay, well, thank you, Dustin. Actually, and thank you to everybody.
who presented today, uh, Samuel, Vinetri, and, and Dustin. Amazing stuff. Um, so many ideas, insights, so much to think about um, and so much to work on, although maximizing, my goodness, already maximizing everybody. It was, it was uh, excellent. So let's maximize the new normal, strengthen our partnerships and encourage and inspire our students and build a better future for us all. So thank you very much for watching. It was wonderful to be here again and feel that buzz from um, even virtually. Thank you for watching and stay safe. Bye-bye.